M, I'm going to give you a... Okay. Go. Hello, car enthusiast. Hopefully you guys are doing well. We are here back for our 38th pod speed. Um, I'm here with Taro Koki, gtchannel.com, uh, as always, and James McKeown, uh, no breaking uh dot com or dot no breaking podcast uh what is the uh what what, what is the uh, website i i never really one you know, of these you days website, you're gonna get right? it right sam one of these days you'll get it right sam at nobreaking.com. you it know i no really went out, okay. really went out there i really went out there and really stretched it <laughs> and today we're gonna take things off the uh off-road a little bit with our guest matt martelli of uh just off-road racing fame uh taro why don't you uh he, you found our guest why don't you go ahead and start uh, the questions because All Matt right. and I think have a lot to talk about too. So. Sure. Sure. <laughs> yeah, Sam jump in anytime. So Matt, uh, thanks for uh, being on our show. Yeah, absolutely. I'm stoked. Um, so guys, uh, I had the pleasure of working with Matt and his brother, Josh at the um, 12 hours of Sebring, I think a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the hotel that we were staying at was like an hour and a half away from Sebring, you know, like there's, there are no hotels near Sebring at least not decent ones. So mm -hmm. Matt and I would take, you know, these hour and a half drives, you know, <laughs> from the hotel to the track. And deliriously. Uh, yeah, yeah, like 5 a.m. in the morning, you know, really late. And uh, that's when I first really uh, got to know you, Matt. Um, so- Wait, were you guys staying in the same hotel? Yeah, yeah. It yeah. was like a big oh, hotel, okay. big group. The crew was staying oh, there. Oh, it was yeah. a big group. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. yeah. It was, like a, it was like a huge thing that they did. Um, mm -hmm. And- um, so Matt and his brother run Mad Media mm -hmm. among a bunch of other, you know, business endeavors. Um, but let's start with Mad Media. Mad Media. So how did um, you guys start Mad Media and get all into the off-road world? Um, it, it's, it's actually, it's a cool and funny story. I mean, we grew up skateboarding and, and working in action sports and, you know, we started Mad Media as a hybrid between, you know, traditional advertising agencies and the, the guerrilla tactics that we had learned in, in skateboarding. Um, we thought we could merge those two ideas and, and create the best of both worlds, be very responsive and tactical, but still uh, disciplined and planned out. Um, and, uh, you know, so we launched Mad Media. But what we very, very quickly found out is, we kind of hit the ceiling in terms of budget in, in action sports. And we had grown up in, in San Diego and one of the other byproducts of growing up in San Diego is it, it's off-road Mecca. So you spend your, you know, your weekends and sometimes your weeknights, um, you know, in the local desert and in the dunes. And so, you know, since my early childhood, we, we've been riding motorcycles off-road and dune buggies and, you know, been involved with car racing teams. Um, so going into that as, as a, um, you know, as a evolution of, of our business was really a natural progression for us. And uh, when did you start taking interest in, in cars or motorsports in general? Has, has it always been off-road or did you like other forms of uh, motorsports as well when you were growing up? Um, no, I, I loved, you know, really other forms of motorsports. I think that like every young American male, you know, you see all the, the different disciplines and, um, I just gravitated towards off-road, um, off-road and rally and primarily because of, you know, it, it seemed to me very early on that it was the most spectacular, the most dangerous, um, it had the most variables, and it was essentially the most free is in terms of rules. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think growing up as a skateboarder, you know, you're very anti-rule. And so, you know, off-road racing in particular and rally racing appealed to me. Um, and just, you know, again, growing up and you have access to deserts just east of you in San Diego, mm -hmm. um, it, it becomes a part of your DNA. You know, you, you look at everything and you're like, well, that's cool, but it's not a trophy truck going 140 miles an hour over three foot. Whoops. Cool. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Hey Matt, and, did you do a lot of stuff with, uh, when you were at, uh, with the mad media, um, brand with, uh, Jim Connor stuff? Yeah, we, uh, 
we actually shot and produced the first three Jim Connors with Ken. Um, and you know, that was a great relationship and a lot of fun. And, um, we, uh, you know, we're, we're heavily involved in rallying in America, uh, at that time. And, you know, really that, um, piece of content came from, you know, our collective desire to show people how rad, uh, rally racing was in the U S and, and show how rad the drivers and the vehicles were. And, you know, um, I think one of the, one of the fallacies of, of growing up in America is we're taught to focus on, uh, only American cars. And, and, and so consequently, I think a lot of young Americans, they miss out on, you know, the capabilities of, of high horsepower, turboed cars, you know, four cylinder, six cylinder cars, the things that you guys are very adept with, um, you know, and so we just, we wanted to show how radical, you know, these vehicles and these drivers were, and that, that was kind of the nucleus of, of, you know, Jim Connell. Didn't the X Games um, come before Jim Connor though? Before you got into the Jim Connor stuff? Yeah, actually. So Ken was uh, was racing rally racing, and um, you know we were we were out documenting it and putting out a lot of content. And it, it was pre YouTube, so it was really tough. It was like mm -hmm. every time we did a video, we had to do like three or four different formats. You know, Windows Media Player and QuickTime, and and <laughs> yeah. hope that uh, people saw it. Yeah. And so at that point, it was it was pretty frustrating that um, it was, uh, um, um, you know, we weren't getting a lot of attention. So you know, we had gone to, you know, we you know we we were very close with X Games, and we'd gone to them and said, hey, you need to get this, you know, you need to involve this. And um, fortunately you know, they saw the opportunity, you know, mainly to draw in automotive dollars and, and they, uh, they decided to um, integrate it into X Games. Oh, and then just everyone, uh, Matt is talking about Ken. Uh, he's talking about Ken Blocks, just, uh, just so everyone knows. <laughs> the one and only, right? Yeah, the one and only. That must have been awesome working with him, yeah? Yeah, you guys it was grew great. Up together, I mean, right? Didn't you guys grow, yeah, grow really? up together? Yeah, I mean, we went, we met in college and uh, oh. lived in the same area. That's that's how we originally met. It was mm. before he had started DC Shoes. He he had right. just started a company called Eight Ball, um, and then uh, you know, and then later on started G DC Shoes. Now I can't speak highly enough of Ken. You know, he's a marketing genius, and and I was really stoked that he decided to use his own money to go rally racing and really build up everything that he's he subsequently built it's it's been great i think really for the entire community of motorsports um and it's kind of funny that you know even today they're really people haven't gotten they haven't got it. like they still look at him and they're like oh yeah you, you know it's ken block um but they don't understand what what he's done or what we were doing and you know, it, it, it leaves it open to do a lot more really cool stuff in motorsports. Yeah. I don't remember if I told you, Matt, but um, Sam knows my buddy, uh, Ken Takahashi. Remember Ken? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So, so he started this thing called American Gym Kana. And uh, right. <laughs> he decided to, you know, and Ken, I, that's when I first met Ken, you know, Ken Block. He was at sure. these events and maybe you guys were there filming because I've seen, you know, like guys filming him wherever he went. Um, and he, right. he did a couple of like these uh, Gymkhana, like autocross type events. And then, uh, you know, Subaru was going to back up American Gymkhana. And it was starting to become a little bit more than I think Ken can handle. And then he just he just decided to drop it. And then I think that's why Ken just decided, okay, I'm just going to do this thing myself, you know. And then he sure. just filmed, you know, and you guys filmed uh, the first Jim Connor because there was no event to shoot at. Yeah, no, it, it was interesting because, you know, at the time I knew, um, uh, you know, a lot of the other drivers as well, you know, the Reese Millens of the mm -hmm. world that, that were very skilled. And, uh, you know, we just went for it, you know, I mean, it was mm -hmm. like, we had an idea of what we wanted to achieve, but to be very honest, like we didn't think 
at that point it was going to become what it became and yeah uh, you know i could tell you all sorts of side stories of like you know the first one we didn't we didn't put it on youtube for the first few months and and then we got a bill from you know from the video service company and we're like uh we can't afford this so (laughs) you know we we decided to put it on youtube and and really the rest is history um but yeah i think that that that's where i i you know, I give Ken a lot of credit is, you know, he's always been a visionary uh, when it comes to culture and marketing. Like he was able to do things with DC shoes, you know, that even at the time I remember looking at him and I'm like, this isn't going to work, you know, like (laughs) you can't, you can't connect. Like one of the things that DC shoes became very famous for was their, their inner city vibe, right? Mm-hmm. And later on, it's easy to say, oh yeah, it was like urban street well, where, well, that wasn't defined at the time. And, yeah. you know, and, and Ken was really good at seeing these things come up and going, okay, this is how we can connect the dots and, and make it, you know, product. And, and that's really, you know, uh, what he did as well with Jim Connor is he's like, you know, this is cool, but we need to condense it and put it in a way that people can consume it. And, yeah. you know, the irony is that we, it's really a skateboard video with a car. So <laughs> we had both done, you know, lots of skateboard videos before where yeah. we were targeting a, a younger audience with, with, you know, a very short attention span. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's, it's kind of like anything else of, of, you know, getting people interested in something. It's like you have to give them a little bit of the exciting stuff to draw them in and and then they'll they'll look at it and they'll go okay oh oh, i get it like you know this is basically a a rally drive right so um yeah and and i think that you know i always say this as far as just general creative um nothing happens in a vacuum you know there's there's all sorts of influences like you know, we were very heavily influenced by previous films. Like one of them in particular was um, Climb Dance. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, it was a, a mind blowing film with Ari Vatman doing Pike's Peak. And mm-hmm. it's still, in my eyes, that film is still so remarkable because of, you know, how beautiful and violent it is. It really showcases his driving skill set, the environment, and what the vehicle's capable of. So, you know, as we, you know, get opportunities to do more pieces like that. We're always looking for those, those little magical things to happen, but yeah, there were a lot of influences, you know, um, Mm -hmm. drifting obviously was a huge one as well, because, you know, at that point, the idea of four wheel drive drifting was like, you know, unheard of. Yeah. Um, And, you know, we wanted to show people like, yeah, if you have enough horsepower to the ground, you can do anything. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Were you guys involved in the uh, the Jim Kana? What was that called? Uh, Jim Kana Grid was that the the events that they that Ken did? Uh, no, at that point we had we had you know parted ways and we were uh, really more more focused on building you know our off road empire and and mm-hmm. you know taking all the lessons that we learned from you know from you know skateboard business and skateboard culture and 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 applying them to off road culture. Now how did how did that uh, transition go and what what when when did the light bulb go off that okay we're going we're going off road and that's the thing and you guys end up buying the mint 400 i mean tell us tell us about that that uh, journey well you know one of the things that always turned me off about off road was that you know generally it was older uh males older white men that yeah could afford to do it right so like you make a couple bucks in your your business and you can finally afford to, you know, spend a couple hundred thousand dollars or, or whatever the, the, the level is that you're racing at. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you'd see this really cool vehicle performance and driver performance. And then you see this guy get out of the car and he like has to unload his belly first. Right. So yeah. it, 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 frankly, as a, as a young man, it turned me off, you know, I was like, mm-hmm. Oh, this is really cool. And then, you know, it's some old fat dude getting out of the car. So you know, we are looking around for younger drivers, you know, to, to, to get involved in uh, or to get involved with, to, to really, our idea at first was to make a film, you know, Mm -hmm. about the growth of, of, 
you know, the youth movement and off road, which was just sure. beginning to start to happen. Um, and uh, then we started doing more and more work and um, within off road, but very quickly, um, I'm, you know, as you've run into, it's like you start working with race promoters and same thing, you know, it's yeah. a 70 year old race promoter and, <laughs> we're, you know, we're trying to do things and, and ask for things and create content that, you know, is compelling. And so, you know, in that dialogue, we got really frustrated and, yeah. you know, kind of looked at it and both my brother and I were like, you know, I think we can do this better than these guys, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and really the big advantage that we had was, you know, the content side and the media side of being so, you know, uh, schooled in that and having all those assets, like, you know, we, before we owned the mint, we were producing the mint television show, yeah. which, yeah. you know, at the time was a groundbreaking, um, show for, for off-road racing. Mm -hmm. Um, we had been the first ones to, you know, use high speed cameras and, and take red cameras out into the dirt and destroy them. Yeah. Um, you know, and really push the envelope cinematically. So um, that's where it started from. And, and it was just really out of frustration. Um, and, and uh, you know, and then we moved over to the promoter side and just really started applying the things that we saw working from other disciplines from, um, from Formula D and some of their success with, with things that they were doing to X games and some of the things that they were doing. And, and we still do that. I, both my brother and I go out to all sorts of different events, motorsports events and non-motorsports events and look at what they're doing and go, you know, okay, is that going to benefit us? Like, does that, how can that cross over? So, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a constant now. Yeah. I'm sure at the beginning, you know, I've, I've had, experiences with the you know the old school race promoters were you know I, I remember at the beginning it's like they didn't like social media remember like is it was like they didn't they didn't want you to take yeah. pictures and share it because it was some it was a small like this uh wall around their you know race event and uh, I'm, I'm sure you've uh you've experienced that those were the kind of frustrations that I, I'm, I'm sure you had to encounter yeah i mean our you know our goal from day one was to unlock the value of, of off-road racing, right? We, we, you know, we saw the, you know, the dynamics of it and how cool it was and, you know, have had these experiences for years where we would share it with people and then they become lifers, right? Yeah. And, um, uh, but we were always trying to, or and still are trying to really unlock that value. And, you know, social media was, is a huge tool in that and content is a huge tool in that. And yeah, you're right. There were a lot of those old timers who were very resistant to any sort of change. And, um, we were the opposite. We we're like, Hey, this isn't working. Let's try a different way and, and just keep, you know, changing and evolving, um, uh, you know, to try and, and, and gain more, uh, eyeballs. Yeah. Yeah. Has the, um, has the pandemic caused, um, any, well, you guys ran the event last year, right? The, the yes. 400 last year. And um, tell us why, what's happening this year with the Mint. So um, we, you know, normally the Mint 400 happens in March. Uh, we decided to move it this year from March to December to be well outside of the COVID window because one of the, the values of the Mint 400 is that it's not just an off-road race, it's an event, you know? So mm -hmm. we have five days of, of events in and around the Mint and we didn't want to compromise those. Mm -hmm. um, we wanted to just wait and, and get to a point where, you know, at, we were allowed to be fully open. And, you know, also, we also wanted some of the sanity to return, mm -hmm. um, meaning that, you know, I think there was a, a lot of overreaction with the pandemic. I mean, mm -hmm. in particular, we're an outdoor event, you know, so we have a very, uh, a low rate of, of infection, one that's probably not even measurable, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. But, you know, until people kind of, until everything calms down, everybody's just like, okay, everything's shut down. Mm -hmm. You know, don't look at anybody, you know, you're gonna yeah. get COVID in your eye. And, yeah. and so, you know, we just <laughs> opted to, you know, to, um, to wait and go like, look, we'll, we'll push it to the end of the year so that we can 
we can have a full blown mint 400 and not, you know, not have to have some weird compromised version of it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've been watching all the events that have been ha been happening or been canceled and going, Hmm, was that worth it? And, you know, we sit in a precarious position in that we've got to answer to sponsors. We've got to answer to racers and we've got to answer to fans, mm -hmm. you know, and now we were in charge of making sure that we have a, a safe event as well. Um, for the, for the spread of infectious disease, which is like a whole new thing. I'm like, what? Yeah. So, um, but no, it's, it's, it's actually, you know, we're stoked because it's giving us time to do some things that normally we wouldn't have time to do during the year. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and fortunately we're the biggest race um, currently, uh, you know, biggest desert race in North America. So mm -hmm. um, people are coming regardless you know, yeah. they're, they're going to come and they're going to race and they're going to come and they're going to spectate. And I think, you know, our bet is by the time December hits, everybody is going to be so ready to go out and be involved in events. We think it'll be one of our biggest mints we've ever had. That's, that's great. Our Sam Mitani's, uh, we, we were mentioning before that, uh, he's done the Baja 1000 and the Dakar. Actually Baja 2000. Of Baja 2000. Yeah. Okay. When it, yeah. Cause, uh, they, they ran a, a 2000 event in the year 2000 yeah. for 2000 yeah, that's, that's the one right. i was in. yeah well, and you, we, yeah we uh, our done, team broke <laughs> well uh, if you've done jackar and the baja 2000 you're definitely a black belt in off-road <laughs> oh awesome but you know what the, the baja 2000 uh we we didn't finish we got uh the car broke um i, I had a real all-night stint because it was like four or five of us because it's a 2000 mile race and uh yeah i i uh, i got i took i brought the car into the next driver uh, we switched and the next driver, I really didn't get to know too much. You know, we were kind of just a team that put, were put together and he just and took off. I go, ah, that, that we're not going to make it to the end. No, <laughs> like that. And sure enough, yeah. he broke. Yeah. So you're broke. saying that the rot had already set in, Sam, when you got in there, you were the one that no, started. No, it, no, no. I gave him a <laughs> clean, well-running engine, well-running buggy. And it was a flat, uh, our buggy had a, a portion of flat six in it. So uh so yeah nice yeah so that, it, was, that's, it, was, it was fast yeah it was fast so. yeah and it, it, that so those air-cooled engines is really what started off road with um class 11 which is the vw bug and um, right then later on they figured out porsche engines and um changed the transmission from the vw bug transmission to the vw bus transmission so yeah it's it's the, we still have those guys racing with us today it's really cool yeah, I think my uh, my stint was about seven, eight, nine hours, eight hours or so, you know, seven hours or so at, at night. Yeah. So and it was dark. It was really dark out there. And uh, Matt, you you've driven that many times, haven't you? The Baja? Have you? Yes. Yeah. Boy, it gets cold. Nighttime. Oh, yeah. It, it is. I couldn't believe how cold it got. Well, this is Mexico, man. But it was <laughs> freezing because, yeah, you know, we, we got stuck a couple times, got out of the buggy and Oh, it was freezing. It was freezing. So anyways, yeah. So that was a great adventure. And then, of course, uh, uh, the year I went, did the African rally, the uh, Dakar rally, it was um, in 96 and it was called Granada to Dakar. So it didn't start in Paris on that year. That year it started in Granada, Spain, but it was the same, you know, Dakar rally. So and I finished yeah. that one. Three and a half weeks out there. That That's that's a huge accomplishment. I mean, yeah. you know, that was when all of the guys who are really legends in uh, that form of off-road, which is called rally raid, they all regard the, the African Dakar as the real one. Um, although I will say I went last year um, to the, the current version of it, which is all in Saudi Arabia. And I was really impressed with the terrain in Saudi Arabia. Uh, you know, for some reason, I had expected it to just be all dunes and mm -hmm. it wasn't it had a huge variety of train and terrain and it was oh, stunningly it beautiful. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah. In my mind, you said Saudi Arabia, I go, that's all dunes, man. But no, huh? Yeah. There was all kinds. No, of stuff it was, there. it was, it was really impressive. And, and I think that, uh, it's a good, it's actually a really good home for, uh, you know, an off-road race like Dakar. Um, you mentioned the name Ari Vatani, and I just go, wow, that's a blast from the past. He was a uh, he mm -hmm. he was driving, I think, a Porsche 959 or something in that uh, Dakar event. Um, yes. That year, I don't know if it was 959, but he was yeah he was he was one of the drivers. So, so yeah, yeah and that, that's one of the things. 
you know, one of the reasons why I respect, I, you know, him in particular, but drivers who cross over disciplines and, mm -hmm. you know, go from pavement to dirt and dirt to pavement and so on and so forth. I mean, in the history of the mint, you know, we had guys race like, you know, Parnelli Jones and um, Unser's and in you know, all yeah. sorts of, of crossover guys um, mm -hmm. and still do. I mean, one of the one of the coolest things that's happened over the last couple of years is um, Jensen Button came and raced with us. Oh yeah, and, yeah, uh, that's right. Very cool. Yeah, he he's since bought a truck, um, which is cool. Really? So and now yeah. he's he's racing in Extreme E, you know. So yeah, he's, really so he's totally gotten track. into it, huh? Yeah, and and I, you know, again, it's it's one of these things you asked me earlier about what are the disciplines of racing that I I like, and I I really like all of them, you know. They're like, mm -hmm. I really love drifting. Um, I love rally um I, I love road racing um you know all of them have their kind of you know very uh um qualities about them that i really like mm -hmm. but you know this is you know obviously i'm biased but i think once you have the the visceral experience of of racing off road there's really nothing like it you know and especially in the experiences that you've had sam where it's like you're out in the middle of nowhere. Nobody's going to help you. Something breaks. Oh, yeah. You got to figure it out. You got to, you, you know, you got to figure out navigation. You know, there, there's, there's a lot and um, it's a challenge, you know, and every time you come out the other end, you're, you're, you know, it's like you've gone through a war and uh, you go back to normal, normal life. And you're like, wow, this is boring and easy, you know? <laughs> well, actually, Matt, you know, we kind of went through uh, literally a war because, uh, uh, our car, our team, and we were in a Nissan Patrol, a pretty heavy duty four wheel drive uh, Nissan. And uh, we uh, we kind of got lost because, you know, I mean, back in 96, we didn't have navs, you know, those like your Garmin nice nav systems. We were doing it by the book, right? Having, right, you know, right. uh, uh, navigator, we'd switch off doing the navigation. And we, uh, I can't remember, I think it was Mauritania or something. We kind of went, we were about 100 miles off course. And uh, we were stopped by the military and uh, in the middle of nowhere, I tell you, it's just, we're talking just the middle of the, just desert everywhere. And there's this one hut, it looks like a stop. And uh, I told, I wasn't driving at that time. I said, hey, blow the stop. We, we do not want to get stopped by these guys or, you know, because these guys kill people. So, and uh, my co-driver is a Japanese guy and he, you know, I guess he, he, he loves following rules. He stops and I go, oh, of course. Shoot. <laughs> and they speak French there. And back then I spoke pretty okay French. And yeah, I, they took me out of the car at, uh, at gunpoint. So three guys on me on gunpoint took me into the shed and I go, Oh man, this is it. This is where it's going to end. <laughs> and he kept me there for three hours, dude, just talking about my, our passports were no good. Uh, yeah, yeah. you know, he was asking my mom's name and he was telling me I'm a liar. He's going, you're a spy from Toronto. I go, no, we're part of the race. <laughs> and the way and I, yeah i really go this 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 is it man this is it. i'm dying in the middle of this freaking like a, a butthole of the world here in the sahara desert but uh and, and you know i had these guys they had the they had the rifles on me and i'm just going jesus you know i and i was thinking of making a you know making a run for it i was thinking okay i gotta i gotta get out of here and make a run for it but then i go i'm gonna get shot so and then so but uh then he says how much money do you have and i go oh, okay of course. Now it's, this it's is all of <laughs> yeah. But then I was thinking, hey man, I was watching the sun kind of go down, and I'm telling you, you know, the, the the building I was in had no windows; it was just a hole in the wall, right? So we're talking stuff from the movies, kind of, you know, like so. Yeah. And then yeah, he's and I told him well, we didn't have any money, so I go, hey, we don't have any money, but anything you want out of the car, if you let us go, you could have. They took all our clothes, right? All our dirty clothes, everything, and and he says, okay, you could go, and. <laughs> <laughs> he let us go so we, we had to drive to the next town which is like another what eight hours away because we had to get back on the track we bought some clothes and then we you know we found our way back on the race so uh, that kind of that kind of like lawlessness exists in these rallies man i'm sure you know and it, it was crazy yeah. so yeah so well, sorry man, that trumps any, that trumps any baja story i have <laughs> but uh that's <laughs> But that's, you know, I mean, you survived and you came back with an unbelievable, you know, story and an adventure, you know, so that's yeah, part I of what I'm so, yeah. 
So did you, you wrote about that in your story in Road and Track? Yeah, yeah, it's all in there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's all in there. Where yeah, they they pulled me over, and I was going, "This is it. This is it." Crazy. Man. <laughs> so, so Sam, you got to do the Mint Four Hundred now. I know. Maybe we 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 should Taro, me Taro and James, we should get in a car and do this right. Team, team together. Channel. Definitely. How many classes do you have? Um, last year we had twenty six classes, so we have a huge oh. variety of vehicles so you know people can still race a class 11 a vw bug you can mm -hmm. race a motorcycle and then that goes all the way up to the premier trophy truck class or unlimited truck um you know which is now um the top the top guys have moved to a four-wheel drive platform in the last mm -hmm. you know two years mm -hmm. so a build of one of those vehicles is about eight hundred fifty thousand, mm -hmm. um and then you know, a little bit over a eh, million, million, five a year to run. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it's interesting, too, because the Mint is such a rough course. It's one of the only off-road races currently that, that a four-wheel drive uh, vehicle has never overalled it. So mm -hmm. um, it's the cool evolution of technology, you know, a cool story that, that's unfolding uh, right before our eyes. Yeah, Matt, you talk about those numbers, and that's just jump change for Sam. I mean, that's just what he carries around in his back pocket. <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah, right. He, keeps, he keeps that in 20s now on a suitcase right. that he carries everywhere with him. Like, exactly. He's just got a little briefcase that he just pops open whenever he goes <laughs> yeah. anywhere. Well, you know, it, it's funny because you talk about the, the cost of, of just racing, and, and, you know, it's actually less expensive than many forms of pavement racing, you know, that, that are of the same caliber. So... You know, I, I know there there's still significant numbers, but um, you know, you could you know step out of IMSA and save quite a bit of money by racing off road. That's true. <laughs> when you think about that, that is true. The um, uh, you know, the trophy trucks I run in Baja and all those are, are those uh, part of the Mint 400? I mean, pretty much unchanged. Yeah, yeah. So we we pretty much run all the same classes. Mm, okay. um, um, you know, and like we have a few like again like we started a couple of years ago we started um with the growth of utvs we created a rally utv class and um what that class was created for is is for people to come try racing so it's a stock utv mm. uh, with aftermarket cage and safety equipment on you're you're about five grand worth of stuff mm -hmm. and then you're racing um mm. and it's called the rally class because we did that in conjunction with some of the rally promoters in america so that mm. people could you know, with one car come race off road races and then take that car and go race in, in rally races in the US. Hmm. Do you think you'll be doing things with like this new American Rally Association or, you know, have, have those guys come and race in the Mint or something like that in the future? Yeah, I mean, the UTVs, I mean, the, we'll, we'll definitely do it. The, the regular rally cars, um, mm -hmm. they just don't have enough clearance in the end. Uh, yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Although I will say a stock VW Bug doesn't have very much suspension either. So, oh, but they don't—they don't they raise them quite a bit for that. You know the 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 modified ones are called Class Five, and they do lots of work to them. But the the stock Class Elevens, I mean, it's pretty much a stock Bug with safety equipment. In it. <laughs> wow! Uh, how many use uh, uh, those UTVs too? Are most of the ones that are uh, uh, part of the Mint Four Hundred uh, Two Seaters? So do you have a you have a couple drive, driver co-driver? Um, they so some of them are two seater chassis and some of them are four seater chassis that have oh, been okay. switched to a two seater chassis. The four seater chassis has a better length for you. You want a little bit longer car for the bumps. Hmm. Um, you know, the shorter the wheelbase, the more the, the car bucks. Right. Um. So you know, there's kind of a sweet spot. It's it's kind of interesting, like. Um, in different manufacturers, like for Polaris, the, the four seat vehicle is kind of the sweet spot and the Can-Am, the two seat vehicle is kind of the sweet spot. So um, it just depends. Mm. And do you um, own the UTV World Championship event as well? Is that a new thing that you guys are doing? Yeah, so we, we started that race uh, six years ago. Okay. And really what it the the reasoning for it was that we saw this class exploding and we felt like mm -hmm. look if we don't give these guys their own race that they can you know 
really feel good about themselves, um, you know, um, we just felt it was necessary, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and, and at the time, you know, people were in the other classes were, were kind of looking down on the UTV class and calling them golf carts and such. Oh, but, um, God, that's so brutal. <laughs> well, the, the reality is, is that there is no better bang for your dollar in, in mm -hmm. off-road racing than, than the UTV class. So, you know, it's just a, it's a fundamental shift. And, you know, you're talking about a vehicle you can go buy at a dealership and finance mm -hmm. and put, you know, three to $5,000 into, and you're, you're racing, you know, it's yeah, a, yeah, something yeah. that we've, we've never had an off-road. Um, and so it's bringing a lot of new people uh, into the sport, which has been great for us. I was actually it's, looking at Matt, uh, Yamaha, I think, what was it called? The YZX or something, 1000 or whatever the, because Yamaha makes some cool UTVs too. So Oh yeah, uh, the YXE. Yep. Oh yeah, yeah, that one. Oh man, that looked. I was going, wow, that looks like fun. So, and it's totally a uh, uh, coincidental that I'm talking to you after I was like looking around for those. So I'm going, maybe it's a message. Is that that's, for that's, roaming, roaming around your property and uh, the is. big that's, island? No, no, that's that's, that's, that's why Sam Moyes has a suitcase ready for any just an idea yeah, pops his head. He can just head straight to the dealership and just pick one up. He doesn't need a finance. He just right. his cold hard cash. Matt, walks can I away. ask? You, is there a, is there a? You said there is that uh, the championship for the UTV that you guys have been running for six years. Is that a series or is that just one race? Uh, our race is just the big finale. It's the Super Bowl of UTV racing. Mm, okay. Um, we we plan on doing more races, but um, when we, you know, our view is we'd rather put on the best, biggest races um, than you know be ne necessarily burdened with like, hey, we've got to do six races and figure out you know where mm. to do them and you know and all that kind of stuff. So um, yeah, UTV World Championship is just a one-off. Um, we we it had now? it last October. Uh, oh, Lake Havasu. Oh, Lake Havasu. Okay. Yep. Okay. Nice place. Um, can you see it growing? Maybe some kind of series. You know, like uh, other other venues say, "Hey, man, we want in. We think this is fun." You know, um, you know, for yeah. the parts of the country or stuff. Stuff. I mean, like you said, it's the best bang for the buck. It's fun, and I'm sure it's competitive. Is you know as hell so. yeah it, it's i mean really utv racing is exploding you know mm -hmm. all over america all over the world you know uh two years ago was it two, yeah two years ago i was in in china and uh i'm in the middle of the uh desert in inner mongolia and there's dudes on razors you know and i'm like okay you know like um if if they can be in the complete opposite part of the world than us um they're, they're definitely you know, growing. So yeah, I mean, there is lots of um, grassroots uh, UTV racing going on all over the country. It's a really versatile um, vehicle platform. The one you spoke about, uh, the YXC, it's a really fun car for tight stuff. That one, that one has a shifting yeah. transmission in it. Yeah. yeah. Um, so those are a blast. I, I did a, a uh, a trail ride with those guys last year I think it was mm -hmm. at the beginning of the year and uh man, I had a blast I really loved the the ability to shift and control the car that those those the Yamaha's offered mm -hmm. um so it was a lot of fun but yeah they're either it's a very competitive class because of the amount of of entries and, and talent in it and it's pro it's definitely one of our most competitive classes um so uh, Yes, I, I continue to see it growing. In fact, the irony is during this pandemic, uh, both Can-Am and Polaris, their sales are up like 47% oh, yeah. in that segment. And it's 70% new users because wow. frankly, people just want to get out and do something. Well, yeah. Matt, that's exactly why I was like kind of looking around online going, <laughs> you know, I need to get out. <laughs> I want to put some brakes or do something. And the UTV looked like it looked like the most fun, especially when I was looking at the Alma, I think it was mid-engine. You know, I mean, it's almost like, yes. you know, and the suspension yeah. almost looks like, you know, um, um, the floating suspension, like in a race car, I'm going, this is pretty yeah. crazy. I know there people know about this. I mean, this is race technology, you know? <laughs> yeah, so. they're, they're very, you know, for the dollar, you know, again, I, I've been doing this since I was a kid and, right. you know, mm -hmm. the amount of technology, I mean, those vehicles in general have 18 inches of travel, right? And that means your, your wheel can go up and down 18 inches, right? Yeah. So you can jump these things, you know, 
five five feet plus in the air and land the flat without any problem stock right Mm -hmm. we're not talking about a modified one you can do even more with a modified one so you know it's a funny and i I love doing it to people i feel like a drug dealer i'm like hey why don't you come (laughs) ride razors with us right and i know it's gonna financially ruin their life right you're giving them crack (laughs) <laughs> it, it is, it, but it's, it's fun. It's like, we have a, one of our good friends who's a lawyer and he was a diehard Porsche guy mm-hmm. and, you know, had some pretty nice, you know, Porsches, even a track car. And uh, two years ago he came out and went on a ride with us. And then, you know, and then he bought a car and then he bought a trailer and then he bought a F three fifty and, you know, he calls me the other day. He's like, you know, I hate you. I just had to sell two of my Porsches so I could park my trailer, <laughs> my truck, and my and my UTV. And you know, my response is like, yeah, but you're you're having fun, right? You, you know. So, um, you know, again, it's it's the gateway drug to off road, and and we're really stoked, um, you know, to to have this opportunity to share, you know, uh, off road with people. I mean. I had been talking to the president of Polaris, uh, you know, about a year ago um, and explaining, you know, the fact that, you know, I've gone pre-running for the Bottle 1000 for, you know, over 20 years. And Mm -hmm. I've been down that peninsula, up and down that peninsula with like the biggest, baddest teams in the sport. Mm -hmm. And uh, two years ago, I did it in a UTV. Mm-hmm. And I can't tell you how much fun we had and, mm-hmm. and, and how problem free it was, you know? Nice. Um, and that's, a, that's a paradigm shift. I mean, for you to go have that experience prior to these new sport model UTVs, you'd have had to spend a hundred thousand dollars on a vehicle, another $20,000 on logistics. And, you know, now, you know, we did that trip with, with, uh, four UTVs and, uh, you know, we we're in a few thousand dollars, you know, it, it was yeah. really uh, not expensive at all. And, and just a remarkable trip. I mean, to uh, cool. be competitive in the, uh, 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 you kind of, you kind of brushed on price uh, before, but like in the mint 400, how much, how much would you need to spend to, for, for a guy just coming in and going, Hey, I just want to do it for the experience, you know, uh, like 20 grand, it just, 30 grand. Yeah. I mean, look, it depends on what class. I mean, we've seen a big, resurrection with air-cooled engine classes because there's a lot of these vehicles sitting around not being used and you know those you can put together for a few thousand bucks and you know come race you know i mean i've seen you know used cars you know uh you know for ten thousand dollars um you know that are capable so that that's you know or motorcycles obviously the cheapest one mm-hmm. um yeah, but then it's kind of suicide so <laughs> <laughs> well you know but the you know you could buy a you know thousand dollar used motorcycle and come race them in as well and it's important for us to keep those entry levels um affordable for the average person um but yeah it depends on scale i mean even now you know, with the UTV class to be competitive at the top pro turbo class in UTVs, you're looking at a hundred and fifty thousand dollar race car, right? Wow. Um, yeah. But so like I said, we big we, spectrum, huh? Well, just a huge, spectrum. A huge spectrum. Yeah. yeah, and and that's what makes our sport great. Is it's like you're you're having in in you know a stock class 11 vw bug you're having the same experience that the trophy truck guy is you're going around the same course Mm -hmm. um you're just doing it you know on a budget versus um you know what he's doing it at and a a lot slower yeah but you know what those like for me if someone says hey you want to drive this trophy truck in this crazy like a baja you know i'm i'm I'm, you know i'm a little too old for that now that's pretty intense those things go so fast and that's but a utv i'm going yeah that that looks like a lot of fun so yeah, I, I, I totally see that. So um, um, I hope your December uh, 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 event just, is, is just huge, you know, so because yeah, like, everyone wants to get out now, you know, everyone's yeah. booking trips, you know, for the yeah. at, at the end of summer. So. So in the awesome. meantime, how does uh, how does everybody, you know, follow you? I, you've got a new podcast out, right? Uh, with yeah, the just... off-road racer. Yeah, so we 
in addition to you know running races, we have a couple of websites that, that are media outlets for off-road and for UTVs, uh, UTV Underground and then offroadracer.com. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, we're always looking at stuff um, and trying to give people information and entertain them and, and show them you know, who the, the characters in our culture are and, and really just be good ambassadors. So we just started the Off-Road Racer podcast, which mm -hmm. it's funny because we're, we're video guys. So mm -hmm. it's a video podcast, right? There's still an audio version of it, but, yep. um, you know, we, we shot video of the, the interview. And the first one is with a good friend of mine, Casey Curry, who mm -hmm. uh, last year was the first American to ever win Dakar in four-wheel vehicle. Yeah. Um, and that in a UTV in a Can-Am and he just switched over to Polaris uh, mm -hmm. and he'll be going back this year. So I thought it was a good idea to sit down with him and, and get some of his experience and, you know, talk about the future and, and really go from there. Cool. Um, and you have uh, Instagram and social media accounts for, for, uh, for a UTV underground and off-road racer. So folks yeah. can follow you. Okay. Yeah, if you just search those those two brands, uh, you can find everything. It's pretty pretty straightforward, right? Cool, cool. There we go. Instagram, the gram. UTV yeah. Underground. And uh, how often are the podcasts? Uh, the podcast is on our YouTube page um, on Off Road Racer uh, on YouTube. Okay, so everybody. Go check out the Off-Road Racer podcast on their YouTube channel and subscribe. All right, Matt, thanks for uh, being on our show. It's been uh, uh, an honor and pleasure. Uh, always uh, great chatting with you. Uh, I'm, a, I'm, a white, I'm a white belt in Off-Road, but uh, I'd love to come out and uh, check out, check out uh, uh, Matt, the Mint 400 this year. Matt, just talking to you about this thing is making me want to go look at that couple UTVs now man do it Sam do I, it do it I, I know hear I about might, you I might, one be, I might be calling you and just like cursing you I go Matt you <laughs> got me hooked on this thing I mean it's it looks like so much fun you know it, it looks it, it, yeah it, it honestly is I mean it's funny because you know again I have a lot of friends who you know are track guys and and, and do all sorts of, of different disciplines of, of racing and they all have UTVs because they... Oh, did we lose them? Oh, we lost. Oh, he's freezing up. He froze. But man. He, he'd have so it maybe, up for me. Maybe that's God saying, okay, Savvy, you, you don't have to do UTVs. <laughs> you don't... I'll stop him right here. <laughs> so. Oh, man. Well, uh, if we don't get Matt back, we just like to thank him. Um, it was very educational. I mean, James, doesn't it sound like something you'd want to do? Oh, there you are, Matt. He's back. Oh, there you are. He's back to sell oh, you, you another UTV, yeah. Sam. You froze up for about 10 seconds I wasn't there, man. finished telling you the UTV yet. Yeah. Hey, Matt, but you know what? I think, you know what? Talking to you has like really piqued my interest. The reason it has is because there's a place to go compete with it. You know, it's not just go buy a UTV and just go yeah, out yeah. for the weekend. Hey, you know, you could actually go and, you know, uh, enter some of these competitions and get that competitive juice, you know, flowing again. And that's what sounds really cool, you know, and be part of that community too of, you know, um, with guys like you and, you know, other enthusiasts who are not just UTV guys, not just off-roaders, off but just, you know, motorsport guys, you know, so. Absolutely. Awesome. And, and there's, there's all different levels of competition going on all over, really right. all over the United States and all over the world. Yeah. So you don't have to be an Ari Vatanen or Jensen Button to, yeah. you know, because you could, you could, you could, you know, you could go in with, you know, you could just be a, a Sam Matani. Well, no, that's way up there. You. <laughs> <laughs> well, all right, Matt. Have, uh, uh, next week. Yeah. We have hopefully Tanner, I'll Tanner see Fox. you at one of these events, man. it would be awesome. Awesome. Well, thanks right. for the time, guys. I appreciate it. Oh, thank thanks you so much, Matt. Thanks, Matt. All right. See you. Speak soon. All right. Bye. Cool. Oh, cool. Hey, Matt, so, you gonna you you gonna hang out or? No, I'm 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 tapping out here. I'm just. Oh, you are. Out. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Thank you, guys. All right. All talk right. to you later, Matt. See ya. Thanks, man. So cool. we have a uh, off-road. Um, double header because next uh, next 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 episode actually the next episode is uh tanner faust so yeah well that, tanner that, drives that, everything 
<laughs> he drives so, everything, but he, yeah, he started he with everything. off-road. He started yeah. with off-road, right? He's, yeah, he yeah, started so. with rally, went to drifting, and then went back to rally cross. And, and you know what's uh, great is, uh, uh, here's the segue, is one of the cars that we have a good scoop on is kind of uh, off-road related. So maybe I'll start with that one because I was, I was thinking of starting with uh, the other one. Um, but I guess I'll start with the uh, the um, Toyota um, Subi. Oh, okay. There we go. I'm ready when you are, Sam. Okay. Well, this uh, you could go ahead and put on that blue uh, the blue one. So those who follow GT Channel on uh, social media has uh, no doubt seen this uh, car. And yes, it's another sporty machine co-developed by Toyota and Subaru. Uh, following their joint venture on the uh, Toyota 86 and the Subaru BRZ, as most of you all know, uh, the new BRZ came out not that long ago. And uh, sticking to the um, uh, the um, uh, off road uh, racing uh, off road racing theme, uh, this car is solely based on uh, the WRC race car. Uh, the two companies are reportedly working on to compete, or not WRC race car, but the a rally race car. Uh, the two companies are reportedly working on to compete in Rally Japan. So, uh, because as we know, um, Toyota has uh, uh, has is uh, competing in the WRC with the RSGR, right, um, James? Hello, James. James is frozen. Oh, he is. Oh, okay. The uh, GR Yaris. Yeah, or the GR Yaris, right? So, anyways, I'll keep going. Oh, shoot. So, uh, well, is the photo? Yeah, the photo's still up, so we're good. So the car was a. Uh, this car was supposed to make its appearance this year, but uh, because of the pandemic, it's been postponed for 2022, next year. And okay. this car is about the size of the Subaru Impreza Sport, and definitely it will be a hatchback, as you can see in this uh, photo here. That so, it's, so it's a it's a it's a real it's a real thing then. Huh? It's real. Uh, that's what our otaku ninjas, our ninja, our, our otaku, otaku ninjas, ninjas are saying. Yeah, it's pretty so. rare. We just real. lost the image, but I'm sure James will come back with it. James, so. will, James will be back. Yeah. Yeah. Our otaku ninjas are. I tell you, man, they're climbing walls. They're uh, they're snooping through little closed windows. I mean, they are they are working. So. Uh, <laughs> So just like real ninjas. So this car is about the size of a Subaru Impreza Sport, and it will okay. definitely be a hatchback. Uh, we hear it will come powered by a 2.4 liter uh, flat uh, flat engine, inline four engine, uh, probably the, the Subaru engine, right? Mm -hmm. uh, with Subaru's symmetrical all-wheel drive system. So uh, it won't be the uh, four-wheel drive system that's in the, w uh, the Yaris. So it okay. will have its. It will have a Subaru symmetrical all-wheel drive system. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you put the, your thinking caps on, guys, the production of this uh, version of this car doesn't really make sense in Subaru's lineup. I don't think. I don't know what you guys, uh, what you guys think, but uh, because the Subaru has the WRX and the WRX STI, and that's kind of like their Halo performance car, right? And this is just about a little size of it, maybe just a little smaller. So um, yeah, but the BRZ doesn't make sense for them either, at all. It's a brand new car, though. It's not like they have something there. You know what I'm saying? Uh, this, you know, this, you know, uh, this could be like a two door WRX uh, or WRX SCI. So, but we think it could really work in Toyota's lineup, uh, bringing the car back as a Celica GT4. Now, mm. if you guys remember the Celica GT4. Yeah. As, as far as uh, really cool cars from the 90s go, the Celica GT4, the ST205, the very last one, uh, was definitely one of my favorites. I think it's one of GT. Uh, there it is. Yeah, uh, that's a great uh, one. Yeah, it was it was awesome. And mm -hmm. it it also rallied, right, in the WRC. Also rallied, yeah. Yeah. And, also uh, uh, Pikes Peak as well. Yeah, and, and uh, to tell you the truth, I drove this car in Japan because they didn't offer it here. Mm -hmm. It was absolute hoot to drive. I, th I thought, I go, wow, why, why isn't this car, you know, why don't they make more and just market the heck out of it? Because mm -hmm. to me, at, at that time, the regular Celica, was, you know, the one that looked like the Celica, mm -hmm. but not yeah. the GT4, was, it, you know, was pretty tame, but yeah. this thing was just awesome. So this thing had 255 horsepower coming from a two liter inline four and had uh, all wheel drive, uh, making it, you know, one of the hottest hatches of the day. Mm -hmm. And the race version competed in the WRC in the 90s. So 
uh, if everything works out and if everything our otaku ninjas are saying it's true, this car would really add some fire to Toyota sports car lineup because it'll yeah. fit right in between the 8.6 and the Supra. Mm -hmm. And it'll mark the uh, return of the Toyota Celica GT4 if they decide to bring it back as a GT4. But I, I think it makes sense. So here, I'd like to open it up for discussion with Taro and James and thinking, well, what do you think about this uh, this idea? I'm not sure making this about car with Subaru the Celica. And bringing it back as a Celica. So go ahead. I, I don't know about bringing it back as a Celica, but it, you know, with the BRZ, the majority of the cars they sell are the Toyota GT. It's, right? it's they, 90 they, 10 split, right? Yeah. Basically. So if it right. makes sense for Toyota, you know, they might do it, but I'm not sure if it will be a Celica GT4, though. You don't, do you, you don't like the idea? I, I, I just don't know if it, uh, if, if that car that we just saw the, you know, the, uh, go ahead, the, James, can you, the Toyota, nice the little... Toyota Subaru mix? Yeah. Nope. Oh, it Whoa, that that's car. A, that's a good look. Oh, there oh, we go. Man, you are you're you're giving everything away, James. <laughs> that's what <laughs> I'm here preview. for, Sam. That's what I'm here <laughs> for. Sneak preview. <laughs> so, anyways, I don't know, man. This thing, uh, this this image here, the one that Best Car uh, provided for us, does have the Subaru badge on it, but mm -hmm. um, with the Toyota badge. I mean, it just uh, looks like the Yaris. It looks very similar to the Yaris. Yaris it just looks it like, does. like the Yaris again, four door again, that we saw again, guys, last week. Again, or last again, episode. Guys, stop. Again, guys, this is like an artist <laughs> rendering of it. Uh, maybe he wanted to make it smaller, but let's stretch it out a little bit. Uh, oh, I thought it was a real big, picture, Sam. I thought this was the car. You're telling me this isn't the car? Okay, you guys are being silly now. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways um, so for those of you who are only listening to the audio version the oh the you can see car, the image on gt channel facebook page too. yes please go yeah. to gt channels uh, but facebook, you can't but, see uh, the image of the smoke coming out of sam's ears it as he gets no, madder no, and madder no, 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 at taro no, no, myself <laughs> um james what about you i mean to me i i can't see it going much bigger i can't see it I, it to me i don't i'm just not really a, Understanding this one, I think that Toyota has a great range of small cars. Um, they've got the small performance cars now, obviously, with the Gazoo Racing brand. I mean, I'm not right, sure right. this one at all, how would it fit in? Mm -hmm. um, I'm at a loss, but I really, really need to get down and discuss this, though, Sam, as we flick past the next article. But are you telling me that you call the Celica a hatchback? Because if you do, I'm a little confused. I always thought it was a sports car. Is this just me? Or is it? I, I see. I would not call the Celica a sports car. I would call it maybe a sporty car because I think um, yeah, the, this isn't a hatchback, the, though. Yeah, the last it's a two door version. sports oh, coupe, dude, Sam. What do yeah. you mean? It's, it's dude, not that's a hatchback. hatchback there, dude. No, it's not. This is yeah, not this a hatchback. Is not a this, is a, this, this is, is a not a coupe. hatchback. It's not a trunk. Uh, it's listeners, not a, it's not listeners, a hot hatch. It's not listeners, a hot hatch. viewers in the comments, let us know is the Celica a hatchback? Or is it is the GT4? Is it a hatchback or is it a sports car? That's all we want to know. All Stop. we want to know, just in the comments. That's it. This is a three door. So, thus, it, it, it's a hatchback there. That thing rises like a hatch. It's not a trunk. It's a boot, Sam. Let's just get this clarified. Well, boot. no one calls the 240 SX a hatchback either, though. I mean, you know, it has a same kind of a hatch. It's a, that's it's a yeah, two door it's a coupe. Hand. Okay. Nobody calls the Lamborghini Contact a hatchback. Oh, I mean, shoot. it's now, see, now, you're getting, the, now, now you're getting, now you're getting. Now. Okay, just say so, it, Sam. Let's you compare it against. Okay, but anyways, okay. let's. Okay, but um, like you know, the the Celica, be, a couple Celicas before this, which really had the hatch. To me, that I would call that a hatchback. You know, the one that kind of looked like a cockroach. Sam Nage being yeah. too nice. No. <laughs> so. That's it, but Toyota. Anyways, That's that Toyota sponsorship sponsorship gone. Gone. Sam's calling the cars cockroaches. That's there it. My ride. There, exactly. there goes, yeah, there goes my mid uh, my mint 400 ride. Dang it. There it is. It's gone. <laughs> so. Okay, but anyways, I mean I'm I'm sure a lot of people will agree with you because they, you know, they when they see a hatch, they see a, a hatch back, they see a hot hatch, you know, something compact, compact with a more of a, a silhouette of a like a, a one a one one box silhouette, but mm -hmm. to me I, uh, to me my my definition of a hatch is a little broader. 
I mean, the Corolla is always the Toyota hatchback, but that's, that's a hatch, that's definitely a hatchback. But you know, I and mean, that's what they raced in the WRC when they raced the Celica. It's not a uh, or the Celica. That's definitely not a hatchback. But anyway, let's move was, on to your next. Celica let's move did, on to your next topic. The Celica yeah. did race in the WRC. You see, it did, and they didn't say this is the Celica hatchback. They said this is the Toyota Celica sports car that we're racing in the WRC. No, they just said Toyota Celica. So no, they definitely said, as far as I can remember, <laughs> it was definitely a sports car. They said this is absolutely, positively not a hatchback. No, they never said that. So. But we'll just wait for our listeners and our viewers to give in the comments and see what they think. Uh, I think that's a fair no, assumption. Because all our listeners are like younger generation, and that's the only hatchback they know. Uh, you know, none, none of my old school buddies, my old old school, my uh, my OGs are going to be. All right, let's put it out there, Taro. You go and get so, Sam's yeah, OGs, yeah. and we can have this conversation because I think they're still not going to be saying the Celica is a hatchback. Let's be honest. Okay. We'll do we'll do an Instagram, you know, post. Story yeah, I think post. that's a great idea. Yeah, yeah. Poll, People can a vote. poll on it. Yeah, yeah. We'll yeah. do a, a poll. great idea. Oh man! Oh no! I I I can already foresee I'm going to get killed in this. One. <laughs> <laughs> so, it I'm is what it killed. is. I'm going to get killed. Okay. So, anyways, going to my next car. Um, I'm sure uh, our, uh, you know, anytime there's GTR news, even though some of it might be, uh, you know, um. Um, way out there i know our fans love it because the gtr is such a such an iconic car now especially as far as japanese cars go so uh we thoroughly went over the nissan gtr r36 uh if you remember that kind of uh you know the magenta ish light magenta ish kind of uh, yes. car that that we got mm -hmm. from uh, best car uh yeah, got previous, a lot of views. yeah we got a lot of views in previous episodes of uh, pod speed and we reported then that the new version will come in the latter half of 2022, which is a year, you know, a year, year and a half away as a hybrid. Um, if you need to know more about it, uh, go to YouTube. You'll see it on our PodSpeed. Subscribe to, please, on our PodSpeed page at YouTube. Or gtchannel.com. Or gtchannel.com. So naturally, the R35, the current GTR, will need to go out with a... Say again, sorry. Jay. Is this is this the current R35 hatchback? Is this going to go out oh, with a bang? No, is no, that what you're no, telling no, us? Not, no, that's not a hatchback. Okay, but it's, the, but it's got it's got three doors though, Sam. I mean, it's yeah, a hatchback, okay. right? I mean, yeah, this yeah, is okay. your logic. Okay. Is where yeah, we're James, going. James, I hate to say this, James, but yeah, you're right. It's uh, uh, yeah, my uh, <laughs> my my definition is starting to fall apart already. Okay, all right. So, all right, all right. Yeah, well, well done, James. Thank you for pointing that out. Uh, may, may I continue? Of course, okay. of course. Thank you. Let's move so, on. <laughs> so naturally, the uh, uh, with uh, this R36 hybrid coming in, you know, the the current GTR, the R35, is going to need to go out with a big bang, you know, we, because it really has uh, defined the, the the international high level, high performance supercar for Japan for since you know it came out uh, several years ago. So. Yeah, like 10, 10 years ago. Almost, yeah, it's it's yeah. been a while because I was still at road and track when you know when uh, uh, when that car came when, out. When did it come out? Like two thousand eight. So more than ten years ago. So, yeah, seven or eight. Yeah, something. Yeah, like I thought that. it was seven, but uh, yeah, I'm seven sure our our fans will be able to correct us wow. for our 14, guesses. 13, 14 years then. Yeah, yeah. So, and you know, and to tell you the truth, uh, the GTR Fire it's still the Godzilla, you know, of uh, of the um, of the motors, uh, the the motoring world. And yeah, okay, so there was the Nissan, the GTR 50 uh, by Ital Design, which is what, the million dollar kind of car. But that really, to me, doesn't count because it came out a few years ago and it's an Ital Design project, more or less, not really a you know pure Nissan project. So our Otaku Ninjas are telling us that the boys and girls from Nissan will be, very, uh, will be offering a very special final edition model sometime later this year or early next uh, and they want to do it. They want to go out with a, a pretty big band because I guess there's some, I don't know if you know this, Taro, but I heard there's some like uh, noise regulations are tightening in Japan. So I think a lot of these cars have uh, got to be uh, running quieter. So, mm -hmm. so Nissan could get this thing out before those noise res regulations uh, take effect in, in Japan. So uh, the for this final edition, this GTR final, R34 final edition, we hear that the power of the VR um, engine will be raised to about 720 horsepower. 
So mm -hmm. uh, I think 600 horsepower or so for the Nismo right now. So it's it's going to be quite a bit more powerful than mm -hmm. uh, the most powerful Nissan uh, GTR out there right now. And each engine is based on the GT3 race machine uh, oh. engine, and every one of them are assembled by hand. Mm -hmm. uh, we hear Nissan. the final edition model is going to be very super rare. Nissan's not making it, you know, just they, they just want to make a, a pretty a pretty special statement with this car. So our otakus are saying to expect about only 20 units. Ooh. Yeah. So yeah. not not many. They may make more. Or, you know, we're, we're, uh, to me, 20 sounds a lot uh, pretty low for a special car like this. But uh, they say the price tag is going to be about four hundred thousand dollars on this. Whoa. So when you think about that, that's kind of LFA, Lexus LFA territory. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it will be a, a, a collector's car. So if mm -hmm. you consider it that way, is it worth it? A $400,000, you know, a GTR, you know, with a GT3 race engine in it. Yeah, with, if there's 20 units or even like, say, 50 units produced, I think it will, it, it is worth it if you consider that it, it is, or it might be the last GTR to be powered by a purely internal combustion engine, right? Especially if the R36 comes out with a hybrid, as, yeah. you know, as, as I, every I don't indication the, says it yeah. is. I, I don't see the, the value of, of that car going down, you know, at all. Exactly. So you could no? consider it an investment, right? Yeah. I mean, when you think about it, because these, you know, the way the Japanese cars are escalating in value these days, you know, I mean, this this could easily be a million dollar car in about you know 15, 20, 30 years, right? I don't know if you have to wait that long. If there's only twenty units, right? Yeah, if there's only twenty units, yeah. So this is a rendition. Uh, this image is a rendition of what uh, our our friends from Best Car uh, says it should look like. So it's not going to be too different, as you can see from uh, the uh, stock GTR. But you know, the vents in the hood and stuff might uh, give you a hint that there is a little bit something more lurking. You know. Uh, underneath the hood and um, um, uh, the two-tone paint is something they came up, up with. Our Ninja Otaku says uh, they haven't heard anything about a special color or anything like that, but uh, they did say it will come in a special color. So we don't know what that will be. Maybe a couple special colors. Do they have a name for it? Say again? Do they have a name for it? Right now this? we have our only is the final edition. Hmm. GTR final edition. And, you know, um, and, and Nissan really likes two-tone paint jobs. So I, I'm thinking, mm -hmm. will it come in a two-tone paint job? Because, you know, the Proto Z is a two-tone, right? Yep. Paint job. Remember the uh, uh, 50th anniversary Z and the um, 50th anniversary GTR, those had two-tone paint jobs. So yep. um, being consistent, it'll probably come with some kind of special two-tone paint job. So anyways, I think this is kind of a fitting way to end the R35 uh, just because, you know, what it's meant for Nissan and, you know, um, just... Japanese import car enthusiasts all over the world, uh, which Taro, I'm sure you can uh, you could uh, relate with because you run a um, uh, a website a video site that kind of focuses on import cars. So, called GT Channel. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it is the most popular car on our channel. Our brands, it you know GT Channel started. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, this R35 came out. Oh, so you should, shouldn't you know what year it came out? Like right Yeah, so it was here? like 2000, 2007, I think. I think we're, yeah, I think. yeah two, seven right? or eight. I'm going to look it up. Right yeah, I, maybe Ooh, it was. I eight. don't know why James hasn't looked it up. He's usually so fast. Yeah, but we're, we're about, I think next year is going to be our 15 year anniversary. So it's, uh, oh, this car really? should be about 14 years. Yeah. Wow, so you made it all the way. I know, yeah. still around. So wait a minute. Uh, so wait a minute. The uh, the um, uh, website is older than your children. They are. Yeah. Wow. They are. They are older than. Yeah, two thousand seven looks like. Glad to see I was right, Sam. That's why I didn't need to look it up. Let's be honest here. I said two thousand and seven. I don't. You didn't believe me, Sam. I have to read. Believe me. I'll have to, have to have, listen I'll have to and be, and then send me a note and say, James, again, you were correct. The, the, well, I said uh, two thousand seven, two thousand eight. So I was, I was. Kind of, hedging your bets is what you say you were doing there <laughs> so, but we were the first one to uh uh fully road test at road and track you know the r35 because i had a pretty good relationship with uh, mr mizuno who's the who was the uh chief engineer the uh, chief chief product specialist of this car of course it's a uh, hiroshi kamura now who is mm -hmm. you know really made this thing of just a just a wonderful car to drive so 
Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. So I, I think Tamura is... will stay on as the GTR guy with the R36 as well, or maybe they'll find a new guy for that. Yeah, so, usually they they'll, they'll, they usually make the changes, you know. Yeah. yeah. Tamura San's starting to get, you know, he's he's I think he's in the late 50s, you know, so. So he's getting well, and he's doing the Z now too. So yes, he is, and, and that's why I feel really good about the Z. Letting him, yeah, um, you know, he he, I've known him for like probably twenty years. So oh, really? He's always been a car guy. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, no, he's yeah, a good so, guy. Yeah. So, anyways, that's my report for now. I mean, uh, you guys like the GTR? But you think it deserves a final edition like that? What do you think, James? Um, I like the idea of having the final edition, although instead of having the two tone paint uh, paint situation that Nissan's going for. I think it'd be nice if they're able to go back and throw it back to some of the older paint colors from the older Skylines. I think that'd be a nice uh, one to go with. I mean, if you're spending that amount of money on a car, you'd think they could probably pull together a custom paint rather than giving you this is the only option you have kind of look. I think it'd be nice to go back and have maybe 20 of the 20 different Skyline colors that they had over the years of the different generations as well. Yeah, well, when you you're not that, a fan it's of usually the, uh, silver, the you know? Yeah, no, like I, I actually, to be fair, that the two turn on that, the black and the yellow, I think looks exceptional. I will say I am not particularly a fan, for example, of the 50th anniversary. <laughs> the red uh, and white so or got, the yeah, black and silver. The, the black and silver was just tolerable. The red and white uh, in the test vehicle that I had was, I would say, it's, there's better colors to have. But uh, they also already, didn't they do the, the, the blue uh, yeah. Skyline GTR as well? The other special edition one that came after the, the ITEL yeah, design one? We had that blue, yeah. Yeah, 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 so in the blue and white. So that wasn't yeah. too bad. It was much better than the white and, and silver and the white and red. But I think if they would just went back to straight, solid, bold colors, I think it would look great. But I do like that uh, the rendition, the, the rendering that your uh, otakus did for that one in particular, Sam. Good. Um, so so we, 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 we agree. Yeah, I mean, uh, 400,000 GTR, if it's the final edition one, celebrating the, the, the R35 is not a bad idea. I mean, the only thing I was sort of interested about, though, Sam, is you talked about how to have the GT3 engine. And I always yeah. thought the GT3 engine came underpowered compared to the regular engine in regards to the regulations. So, and it was the... No, but, I, you know, the turbos were different. I mean, there's a lot of different yeah, parts. I, obviously, so. they can always ramp it up a little bit because right. I always know the GT3 cars are always underpowered to go for the oh, longevity exactly. of races and correct, so forth. Correct, but correct. if they yeah, want you to... You know press, they can turn up the wick. You know they, yeah, they can. They can go from a three to a 10 pretty quickly with that, yes. I think, is the, yes, is the yes. case being. But, uh, I mean, if it came with all the accoutrements of a GT3 car, then, I mean, $400,000 and then just putting a nicer interior in it, and some sound editing things seems like a good bargain. Like you said, there's going to be limited numbers in the last handmade, one. Handmade, handmade engine. Even though most, most GTR engines are handmade. Well, the Takumi are always. The, oh, I thought all the GTR engines are still handmade think, by the Takumi. Yeah, I think, it, I think they are right now. So, yeah. So I like a midnight purple. That would be a great revival. Oh, you color. mean like the R34 that Sean has? Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, that cool. would be a cool color to have, you know, because no, that's an iconic yeah. GTR color. That is. That's what I mean, that like is. the solid colors, and you could pick probably like two or three colors, I think, for each rendition of it across oh, the, I the models. Like yeah, I kind of like the midnight purple having one of those as the colors, you know. Pretty, right, because they, they don't right. they don't have midnight purple in the R35, so. Exactly, and it'd be super rare, so yeah, yeah so that's kind of a good idea. That'd All right, cool, guys, throwback. so that is my segment. Hopefully, we'll get a whole bunch of views <laughs> for that GPR <laughs> segment, too. So. Hit subscribe. So, uh, who's, who's next? Uh, James, go. Sure. Well, I'm just talking about my most, let me just pull it up to share here. Uh, my most recent loan vehicle that the folks at Volkswagen were able to let me borrow. And it was the, the Volkswagen Atlas is the one that I had my hands on. You're going to um, hit the Min 400? The, pardon? You're going to hit the Min 400? Uh, I, I would usually, <laughs> but like, I had to, yeah. I had to give it back, uh, Taro. <laughs> so unfortunately there's no min 400, but maybe in December, if Volkswagen were thinking about it, I mean, I think though, to be fair, I'd rather do the one, the John Sibal rendering the vehicle that Tanner Faust drove, uh, for the Atlas cross sport mm. and be much more suitable for the mid 400 rather than this, uh, family three row, uh, <laughs> SUV. Uh, that's just my take, but uh, I mean, I'll let Volkswagen know. But uh, uh, obviously, I drove the the cross the Atlas Crossport last year. This mm -hmm. is the largest sibling of the Atlas, just Atlas, I should say. Um, six inches longer, so it just managed to squeeze in my garage. 
Um, it is a big boy. Uh, let's be honest. It is a very, very big boy. Uh, but I will say that I didn't really get the benefits of this three-seater vehicle because I'm just a, a family guy and we don't have enough other people in the household, be it children or other adults, to necessarily fill up said Atlas. Or so servants. Yeah, so I'm not like you, Sam, that has a team of people that that they run across a different uh, their different uh, homes across the world. Well, you don't surf either, so. Yeah, know. so I I I will say comparing the two though, I did prefer the Atlas Cross Sport to the Atlas. I felt the Atlas was just a little too big. Um, also, in the Cross Sport, I had the three liter six cylinder engine, and this I had the two liter turbo engine. Uh, the two liter turbo definitely. I felt underpowered for this vehicle while it was coming in around 270 horsepower. It's just not enough. I think the V the V six comes in around 310. I think from memory, it definitely needs the extra horsepower to, to get it up and get it moving um, because mm -hmm. you're constantly shifting through the gears. And, and also I had the similar problems I had with the, the cross sport is where I had the weird rear view camera where it comes at a very strange angle. So you always appear to be, close to things than you actually are and when you're in such a large vehicle if you had that extra say two and a half feet of space to help you maneuver it would be a lot more convenient for the right placement um it was nice on the inside and you do have a lot of options out there but this now is a very very competitive marketplace and mm -hmm. i think that some of the korean offerings are probably better spends for your money at this point in time although this one if you wanted to go for it the Atlas is made here in the United States, and you hmm. do have a lot of room in the vehicle if you want to go down with the three seats. And there is, a, you can actually genuinely fit adults in that third row, um, which yeah, is a little yeah. unique, and then still have a lot of room behind you for suitcases and the like if you're going on a road trip. So it is a good looking car, but I just think that there are obviously some other options out there that could come in with a bit more comfort on the inside and a bit more luxuries in this type market at this time. What's the and sticker on this, James? It's It starts around 38 and goes up to around 52, depending on how you spec mm -hmm. it, Sam. Mm -hmm. This one came in at the low 40s, I think, from memory, around 42 with the driveway and the sticker price in this. This was just the two-liter SE, so it was very much at almost the second row of the ladder of, say, five levels being the top on where you're going through. Um, I have to say, James, something this big, they had some guts throwing a two-liter in this thing. That's what I mean. It's, I mean, are you a th two liter? <laughs> that's I mean, still uh, getting two hundred and seventy horsepower of a two liter is great, but oh my god, that's in that's a, a big big vehicle like this big bad boy, yeah. it really needs to be three. I mean, I think for three. I mean, we're talking like Chevy throws five liters in those things. Yeah. <laughs> you but know? you know what I mean. Like uh, efficiency, it was great. It was good in the fuel economy. Um, I, I myself felt that the seat was not so comfortable for my driving style and my position in this one, mm -hmm. um, which is another reason why I preferred the cross sport. I felt the seating position in that was a little better and a little bit more comfortable. Um, but I mean, I could see the appeal if you if you needed the extra room because this is all about the space on the inside. Yeah, and it's if a you family had, car, right? It's a soccer mom car, literally. I mean, it's I, but that's your taking the whole five-a-side team home with you, Taro, in this soccer mom car. That's your, I mean... <laughs> It seats seven, like it seats seven adults. So that's kind of like where you're at with it. It's a, it's, it's a car for lot moving lots of people around. Maybe yeah. this is your church vehicle when you want to bring everyone in and out of church. Maybe that's what you're <laughs> going with this one. Um, because yeah, at that point, maybe you could use it, but maybe my next vehicle that we'll talk about next time is the one that you'll want to take surfing, I think. So uh, that's we've taken this. That uh, we've taken the Atlas uh, on a road trip down, down South before. I, I don't. I don't think it was a two-liter one, but uh, it, the inside was nice. So it's, that's what it's I mean. The inside's it's a inside's car. good, comfortable car. Um, like I said, but I just I think it's just underpowered compared to the competition now, and especially if you were going to be towing, say, x amount of thousand pounds behind you with that. Oh yeah, no, I no, no. You're it's gonna, just you're a not, people you're not hauler. You're going to make it up a hill. Yeah, the, yeah. It's, a, it's a people hauler. Yeah. Yeah. So, but there is a, it's a very competitive marketplace in that one for that car mm. and. And yeah. Kia and Hyundai have got some very good offerings there, especially with the brand new Telluride um, that I think everyone's going to be going up against, and that's changed the game in that demographic. Kia, Telluride's Kia nice. Kia and who? Uh, Hyundai. 
Hyundai. I love the way you <laughs> phrase it. That's a, <laughs> Hyundai. That's a, yeah, that's not <laughs> the, uh, there's how, no, there's how no we say There's no A it. after the, the H and the Y. <laughs> you Brits put a, vowels. <laughs> aluminium, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, yeah, they spelled it. Look, we just I just pronounce it correctly. You guys pronounce it wrong. So that's, yeah, the one right. I, that's what I was talking yeah, right. about. Um, Tara, did you want to go with yours, or did you want to, me to cover my other vehicle, or what did you want yeah, to do? Yeah, just 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 do your other vehicle. You're you're already there. Since I'm here now, this one obviously, um, just let me pull it up. Uh, as I'm sharing, which is the new uh, McLaren Artura, mm. which is their latest Artura. offering. Um, it's going to be a V6 hybrid. This is McLaren's like first engine uh, that they're obviously coming up with. The, the original engine that was the basis for most of their vehicles came from Nissan. Um, but this is their latest offering. I think it's going to be able to go 205 miles now. I think it's got an electric only range of around 20 miles. Mm. Um, lots of changes internally. And I think it's going to sit somewhere where it's going to be replacing some of the older cars and sit just underneath the 720 um, in regards to performance. Let me, if I give me a moment here, I can pull up some details on it. So what can we see? It's a um, 671 horsepower with both the three liter V6 and the e-motor coming through. Uh, I think we're going to have a 0 to, 6, 0 to 60 in three seconds, 0 to 208.3 seconds, and not to 300 kilometers an hour in 21.5 seconds. Was it all-wheel uh, drive, James? No, rear-wheel drive. Rear-wheel drive, okay. Yeah. Mm. So um, there's lots of changes here. I mean, I think that the powertrain's all built in-house now. As I mentioned, the engine's built in-house. Uh, a power-to-rate ratio of around 490 horsepower per ton. Um, it's coming in. Uh, what is incredible, the weight of the car, comes in really low compared to some of the other vehicles in the market. I think they're looking at uh, uh, a light in a car with a curb weight of around 1,500 kilos in regards to that. So that's much cool, like 3,500 pounds. Yeah. 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 That's so, like this car. especially so, if it's a hybrid, man. That's exactly. Yeah. yeah. So they've made changes to the tub because McLaren have been using, they've created, oh, I should say McLaren uh, Composite Center, which is in Technology mm -hmm. Center. Sorry, should I pronounce that correctly? which is based just outside of Sheffield is opened. So they've developed a new um, monocoque that they're going to be using Sheffield. for this car. That's yes. Like, that place is known for its steel. So that's, that's interesting. Yeah. It is. It is. Also, uh, they have the video game museum there in Great Britain for anyone that wants to go to Sheffield when they can't check out the steel works anymore. Um, another fun fact. That's what you come and listen to the Podspeed podcast and want to watch the web show for. Exactly. But uh, it, it is, a, I mean, I think it is a very good looking car. It is. Um, yeah, it's a good looking I, car. Beautiful. It, it right? looks, I, I think that was going to be around $230,000, I think, from memory, if I remember looking at the brief specs I saw on it today. Um, that's what it's going to be around. Um, I do like this green color. I like it a lot. Um, I think it's I fun. You <laughs> I don't? don't? Oh, man. I would, not, I would not buy this car in that color. I'd, but, I'd I, love to buy this car, but not, I wouldn't want that in that color. I mean, I, I, I do yeah. think this looks pops here. It's made some changes, I think, which is interesting, whereas from what I could see and watching the YouTube videos on it, where the seat all moves as one when you're moving the seat around, uh, the steering wheel comes out with Wait. the binnacle all at once. Sorry? Oh, you mean everything moves at once? What do you mean the seat moves at so once? So if you adjust the seat, the seat all gets adjusted at once. So it's, it sort of like cups you around, the idea being now, instead oh, of moving okay. back and forward. So it sort okay. of will let you go more bucket style or more sort of depending on it. I mean, it's it's designed obviously to be a, a GT car, car, but I think the essence is they've put a, their differential setup now has changed to make this easier to drift is the idea behind this to make it a little bit more tail happy. So oh. or controllable on the tail happy side, I should say. Mm. So yeah, I mean, what's not to like about another 700 horsepower supercar coming out? Well, you know, I mean, they're, they are... I would say Ferrari's major rivals when it comes to production cars. I mean, you're a McLaren guy. If you had to pick between McLaren, Ferrari, and James, yeah, I'd, I mean, yeah. I'd go McLaren. Also, yeah. I, I like it now you that we've got Dan Jay Leno. Jay Leno, uh, Daniel Ferrari. So. Daniel Ricciardo is obviously driving for Ferrari now, so he was out promoting this. I'm looking. I'm very much looking forward to a Honey Badger Special Edition. 
um, based on his moniker as a Formula One driver. I think that'd be great. Um, uh, Lando Norris, obviously his partner in crime there. So it'd be nice to have them both have special editions come out and this maybe from the MSO team um, and just seeing where they go with it. But I think it's, I think it's a great option here to come out from McLaren. I like the way things are going. And obviously this is what we're seeing more from companies now with their uh, FEV hybrids. So it has the ability to go electric for a number of miles, but then also the ability to go several hundred more on the petrol engine. But this is where we're going to be going from now on, I see. I think so too. Yeah. Awesome. Love it. Awesome. Right. Thumbs up for nice. me. Yeah. I don't mind the color, actually. I think it's mm -hmm. kind of cool. Yeah, it's just not for me. Uh, that's it's that's why uh, people of class like the color, Tara. That's yeah, what we right. like to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not a classic <laughs> color, man. That's a pretty flamboyant color, man. So By the way, your buddy, uh, your your buddy uh, Lewis, uh, he uh, signed a one year contract, huh? Yeah, one year yeah, extension, just so he can play, break all the records. Yeah, break Michael yeah. Schumacher's records there probably. Yep. So. All right, all what right. do you have, Taro? So um, <laughs> the uh, flying car enthusiast of the group is obviously uh, Mr. Sam Matani. Yeah, well, I covered it a few months ago, and and we have been covering uh, flying cars. Uh, in pod, pod speed for quite a while. I mean, James uh, and I have been rolling our eyes uh, for the past uh, couple months, but- Wait, why, um, why have you guys been rolling your eyes? Because I keep bringing it up? Yes. Because you keep bringing it up. Hey man, GM came out with a little drunk. Exactly. Know? And I, I think, um, Sam, you've, uh, you've, you've, uh, you've uh, read I the just, future again. Exactly. Nostra, I'm, I'm, I, I scoop on, I just scoop everything. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, that's why I said Nostra Samus, remember? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> so I had Andrew, um, our, our man Andrew, mm -hmm. shout out to Andrew. Uh, he, he did a little write up for us. So uh, check it out on, on gtchannel.com. Um, one of the cars that uh, we haven't uh, covered yet, um, Terra Fuji, Fujia. Um, Japanese company? I, I, um, no, it's yeah. not. It's oh, not. Okay. Um, so oh, these guys, Fugia. Fugia? yeah, Terra Fugia or Fujia, okay. um, just this week got uh, their FAA uh, certificate. Wow! Right? Yeah, pretty impressive. That's this FAA. is like, like, yeah, that's that's yeah. pretty impressive. That's the so, real thing. Right. I mean, they are now allowed to go fly. Right. I mean, um, it, well, this, it depends on what what kind of certification they got, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it looks like they met both FAA and the NHTSA safety standards. So uh, this two-seat aircraft and automobile, and literally it, it is a flying car. Um, so they got both the FAA and the NHTSA's mm -hmm. um, standards. And this happened um, on the 16th. So just, you know, like two days ago. Um, but this just came in today. <laughs> Mass layoff said said to oh, hit too bad. Terra Fujia weeks after its flying car was FAA approved. It's too bad. I mean, this car is pretty cool. Look at this thing. You, you this thing folds I, up and you yeah, can drive I, it like I, a I car. I think I'm with James on this. I think I'm with James on this. That thing is ugly. And yeah, it, I mean, I don't think like you're going to be go down any time with that though. That flying shot. I'm just going. Oh my god! I wouldn't jump in. I would rather jump in a Miata with James in that car, that flying car. This, I mean, thing. it looks pretty legit here, though, when it's flying. You know what, though? This, unlike the ones I covered, I, it, to me, this one almost looks like a plane first and a car second, whereas the other ones is a car first and a plane second. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. The um, This one, the, the Klein Vision aircraft. This yeah, the Klein Vision. This is probably cool. the best best looking one that we've seen so far, yeah. right? This is literally well, like a Which a, one does James like? Which one do you like? Do you like the Switchblade? <sighs> I like the Jetsons. I like George Shetson's car. <laughs> we always have one of these. <laughs> just, just poo poos the idea, the new ideas out there. <laughs> I'm not poo pooing anything, Sam, but I'm not going to be getting in a flying car anytime soon. Let's be honest. I don't think any of us are. So yeah, yeah we're not. We're not. I mean, you but, won't even get in a regular car with me, Sammy. That terrified. Well, hey, but you true. know what? Um, Japan just announced last week too, though, that they will be authorizing. Uh, flying cars by the year like 2020 i want to say 2024 or something like like, like really soon yeah. this just came out like this week as well so there's been a lot of flying car news uh going around this week 
so th so just going back to uh, these guys um, so they got their FAA approval but they're going to be laying off like 100 people and, and they're going was, to move the company to China because was, it's it's owned by the the Geely holding group oh really okay yeah wow. they bought it in 2017 oh, also yeah. uh, to be fair i bet that the I bet some of the owners came over there and they thought they saw the mass holes driving and they're like, we can't, we can't bring our flying car here with these mass holes drivers. It's awful. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, well, interesting, yeah, so what, Carl. Yeah. What do you, what do you, so let me just look at this. So look, this thing, um, was yeah, we the covered that at, we covered that in our last uh, episode, that one, um, because yeah. that car was at a, was going to be at CES. Yeah, this is a Japanese car. Right, the Japanese one. Yeah, yeah right, exactly. Yes. Mm -hmm. so. And then they just announced, uh, the Japanese government just announced that they're going to let, like, they're, they're kind of like backing the whole idea of, of uh, um, flying cars now. So, well, Sam, let's, you've, uh, you've yeah, done we it should, again. We should all, yeah, and we should all start like uh, getting, see, you know, getting our, I don't know if it's a, I don't know if you're, they're gonna, you're going to be required to have a pilot's license like that, uh, that you climb engine to. one is you, actually, you need a you need a pilot license let's let's be honest if someone can make money off it to get a license and pay some money then you're going to have to get a license you've got to get you've got to get you paid have to. So yeah you're exactly go in that's the how, air, that's, you need a pilot that's license. how that's how yeah that's how capitalism works there so, yeah just, and then you're going to get a need insurance for both you're going to need insurance for it on the road and you're going to need insurance for it in the air, air. yeah Oh, yeah, man. yeah, yeah and probably yeah, and uh, I'm sure the uh, whatever we call liability would be crazy because you could bring, come down on someone's house. Mm -hmm. so, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it'll be interesting, you know, with autonomous cars and flying cars. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, there's going to be a lot of new regulations and stuff. So yeah, I would rather get into an autonomous car than a, a flying car. Oh yeah, because I think you, you can't drop out of the sky. Yeah, I mean, but you know, but car. autonomous cars. I mean, you know, you get into one of those futuristic ones without even, you know, a steering wheel or yeah, brakes. Know. You know, like it's a, like a moving box, and if it goes out of control, there's nothing you can do inside it. You just have right. to be fair, Tara. Those are generally going out of control, like six miles an hour. I just open the door and then just walk, step out, well, and you'd be you okay. Well, you don't know. I mean, they're, they're you know, you might be on the freeway, right? And but, you're you know, I mean, right now, the, you know, let's be okay. honest, Tara. Right now, they're all just at uh, auto shows and electronic shows, and they're definitely not <laughs> going to be going fast enough to go on the freeway at this point in time. At this point, you're pretty much okay, right? Give it a few years, no, and then maybe you get to that's worry. The future what's, of Uber, man. That's what's going to happen. It's like well, the one box. Thing about, one thing on about wheels autonomous is cars is a coffin on wheels. Is that what you're going to coin it as, Tara? Yeah, yeah. But you need <laughs> a you, you need a pretty kind of sophisticated AI system because they're saying. If you're in an autonomous car and the car sees pedestrians or something crossing the street or whatever in a dangerous situation and then swerves to miss, but it puts you into the wall and kills you, you know, or, you know, because it doesn't want to kill the people, you know, it's when it's faced with that kind of situation. You're kind of, I like you know, where you're taking this, Sam. I really sorry, like how dark, dark you took this very quickly. <laughs> I'm just yeah, saying the, the, the AI about, is going to have to decide who am I going to kill, yeah, right? Is it worth killing you or killing the, yeah, so anyways. And then it's, it, you know, it does weigh up uh, occupants first. So it saves the occupants first, but then you're going to weigh up whether it's going to save the women and children as opposed to the occupants, Sam. So I'll let you make that decision. No, well, I'm not, I'm not going to comment further on it. We'll just see what, how, how, you know, technology figures all this out and you know, all the regulations. So anyways, uh, is that it from you, Taro, today? Yeah, yeah, that's it from me. Uh, uh, next that, week we you're have, promoting uh, flying cars on GT Channel? Yeah, I mean, wow, all right. so I like it that. has something to do with cars, and we have been promoting it. Right? Yeah. So. Well, I have been, but yeah. James yeah. has been just shaking his head every time we bring it up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anything for, oh, so before we go, James, um, uh, what can we expect on no, your wonderful No Breaking podcast? Well, we have had Mr. Lean Customs on re uh, recently, Hanso Echevera. We had Tim Matthews from the Speedway Motors Museum uh, up in Old American History Museum of Speed up in Nebraska to talk about that museum and the Dale. And today we just oh, dropped cool. uh, Igor Polish Chuck from CA Tune, specializing in some of the best BMW builds here in North America. Mm. Uh, he was on the latest podcast today, so you should check it out and talks about I his will. background. I and, drive a BMW, so I know that uh, uh, you drive a BMW upon many of cars in your fleet, isn't that right, Sam? Right now, it's only and I'm looking forward to the poll call. results, obviously, Taro, that you're going to be putting up there later today. We should talk about the poll results next week, Hatchback on next episode. Yeah. 
Hatchback, Hatchback versus sports car. Oh Jesus! <laughs> I, 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 I'm really regretting that this one. So, anyways, uh, Tara, anything else from you? Oh, you're mute. Oh, there you are. Uh, no, um, nothing else. Uh, just um, uh, subscribe. Uh, go to gtchannel.com. Uh, next uh, next week month's guest. Or ne speed. next next episode's guest. Uh, Tanner Faust. Tanner Faust. So that's a special one. Very, very famous, uh, very um, talented. Looking forward to that one. Yeah. yeah. What so. is he most famous for, Sam? Where would that's you a, say Tanner Faust? That's a very good question. You know, um, you know, I mean, the drifting, yes. The Jim Connor, yes. You know, he was he represented U.S. Uh, in that, uh, you know, all out international, almost like X Games thing. Remember? Oh yeah, where, yeah, yeah. yeah the race where, of you know, champions. I mean, because yeah, because everyone, you know, they, they had Formula One drivers out there and everything. Yeah. So he was our U.S. guy. So I mean, I. I he, it's almost you oh, can and of course top speed america i mean top, top gear. gear or top gear america sorry top, top gear, america, gear usa so, yeah. you didn't even want to talk about his hot wheels driving sam come on oh well, yeah I, the I hot wheels you. the hot wheels going around the loop too yeah I mean, that... so yeah oh yeah that too so yeah so very cool so anyways i hope you guys could look forward to that and uh um i guess that's for that's about it from us so again james mckeown no breaking podcast Taro Koki, GT Channel, Sam Matani. See you guys in a couple weeks. Talk to you. Bye, Bye. guys. Bye.